Would you mind to just turn to a neighbor and shake their hands and tell them the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. <laughs> uh, now let's give the Father a hand clap. Let's give the Son a hand clap. Now let's give the Holy Ghost a hand clap. Now tell me his name. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, thank the Lord. I know if I stood here for 30 minutes and said nothing but Jesus, 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 I've preached a good sermon. There's just something about that name. I love that name. Amen. God bless you. My privilege to be here. I've enjoyed all the services that I've been able to be at here and looking forward to the special services we're going to be having through the month of December. A lot of work goes into some of this, and I appreciate those that have dedicated themselves to help out. Many hands make light work, and so I appreciate everybody doing everything they can. Everybody agrees with that, said amen. Amen. It's just like when you're a kid, you take for granted that supper's going to be on the table and the electricity's going to work. And Then when you get older and have to pay the bills yourself and you realize the effort that goes into all these things. So God bless you. Amen. God is so good. One more time, I want you to raise your hands and give the Lord praise and honor. Give Him thanks. Would you do that, everybody? Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I've enjoyed immensely Brother Rick Flores' messages. I appreciate the effort that goes into it. I can tell when there's a lot of effort been put into a preparation and I appreciate that and so God bless you I want to preach this morning if I can the preacher comes if you don't we'll just fumble and bumble along but we're sure going to give it a try alright in your Bible please turning to the book of Luke chapter 11 and beginning with verse 29 we'll read down through verse 32 and preaching from this reading again today. Luke 11, verse 29. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. And I'd like for everybody to say this after me. For behold, A greater than Solomon is here. For behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Do you believe that? Well, give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. Praise God. I'm preaching today again on the subject, The Incomparable Christ. And this will be part nine. And uh, I want you to hear the word of God and give him praise and give him glory. And everybody said, 
Jesus. Jesus. You're the greatest. greatest. Yeah, you may be seated. Words fail me like arrows that fall short of their mark to even hint of the mighty greatness, the incomparableness, the inexhaustibleness of my God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Anybody who has ever looked at the wonders of nature can surely attest there is a God. Scripture talks about in Isaiah 40, verse 25, to whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Anybody that has looked on a star-studded night, a clear night, when it seems the stars and the planets are just a, a reach away with your hand. I remember flying clear across Canada one clear star-spangled night with the northern lights dancing on the horizon. What an awesome, wondrous sight. And how anybody could even think there is no God, that all this just happened is beyond me. It's like Paul exclaimed in Romans 11.33, Oh, the depth, both of the riches and wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I have no words that can adequately describe him. I still feel the best description of him comes from the Holy Writ. That if you read your Bible... It will portray him in the most vivid of lights and his greatness and his power. And we tried to show you in one part of our message on this incomparable Christ of what he is and portrayed as in every book of the King James Version of the Bible. And I remember we got to the book of Lamentations So with that in mind, I'm going to back up one book to the book of Jeremiah who gave us Lamentations and remind you that in it, that he is portrayed as the righteous branch in Jeremiah 23 and 5. The New Testament complementary verse is John 15 and 1 when Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. And then again in this book of Lamentations, he is portrayed as the weeping prophet. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Chapter 3, verse 48. And of course, Jeremiah, who wrote the book of Lamentations in Jeremiah 9 and 1, exclaimed, Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I may weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And so Jesus was exactly that. Reading in the book of Luke 19, verse 41, Scripture says, when he came nigh the city, he wept over it. And we all know the verse at Lazarus' tomb in John eleven thirty five: Jesus wept. And the Jews exclaimed, Behold how he loved him. And uh, I think I'm not stretching credibility when I give you Matthew 23, 37, another example of his pain and weeping. When Jesus exclaimed, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you 
that ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. O oh, church of the New Testament, O oh, Pentecostal church, O oh, one God, Jesus name baptized, Holy Ghost tongue talking church, would you repeat after me, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Oh, and how great this is of Jesus, who is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, the writer talks of him in chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, as the wonderful four-faced man, portrayed with the face of a man and the face of a lion and the face of an ox and the face of an eagle. And reading uh, the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of which can portray one of those uh, faces vividly. For instance, the face of a man. In Luke 19.10, Jesus called himself for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And of course, the face of a lion. Well, in Matthew, it talks of him in 23 verse 37. Excuse me, 27 verse 37. The inscription on the cross, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Oh, don't you want to exclaim that to the world? He is still king. And as Revelation 19, 16 said, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so this goes on and on. The ox, I think, who is a beast of burden, gives us a description of the book of Mark, who is graphic in the multiplicity of the miracles that Jesus did. Reading from Mark in all the chapters, it just goes from miracle to miracle to miracle to miracle. Isn't that just like Jesus to go from victory to victory? Yes, 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 yes. So much so. And of course, John is the eagle for sure, with an eye of looking far and soaring high. Man, when you consider verses like, he that has seen me has seen the Father, that's deep stuff, folks. John 14 and 9. Or before Abraham was, I am. John eight fifty eight. that's profound stuff. And so Ezekiel portrays him as the wonderful four-faced man. Now, Daniel, this wonderful book of Daniel, in 3 verse 25, that portrays Jesus as the fourth man, in the midst of life's fiery furnaces. Now, I'm not here to take a a vote, but I do think I'm correct in that any of us that has been in some tough times or in some hard places can surely say the Lord's always been with us. Could somebody say amen? I'm asking you, would somebody say amen? So he is the fourth man. In the midst of life's fiery furnaces. And a reading of Romans 8 verse 35 to 39 of which talks about who shall separate us from the love of Christ. And it gives us the long list, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, neck and his peril, sword, on and on. And it begins to tell us we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. My, 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 we may have been knocked down but we're not out. We may have been knocked backwards, but we was able to get up again. Can you shout amen? Amen. So he'll always be there as Daniel portrayed him. Hosea now, the third chapter, pictures Christ in this portrayal of prophecy as the faithful husband. Hosea 3 verses 1 through 5. And reading in Isaiah 54 and verse 11. And Jeremiah 49, excuse me, Isaiah 54, verse 5, and Jeremiah 49, verse 11. Of course, when Paul wrote of him in 2 Corinthians 11 and 2, we are his spouse as a chaste virgin to Christ as a husband. Let me tell you, no one cares for you like Jesus. Now, in Joel... When I was researching this, I thought, this is easy. Joel 2, 28 to 32, talks about in the last days, God's going to pour out his spirit. And immediately my 
my mind went to Matthew 3.11, where John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water under the repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Everyone that's got the Holy Ghost shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know that rolling the dice didn't give it to you. I know that some magical so-called four-leaf clover didn't give it to you. No magical intonation of abracadabra, shazam, or open sesame didn't give it to you. But Jesus gave it to you. Aren't you happy for that? So in Joel, he's the Holy Ghost baptizer, and he still is today. Then we go to the book of Amos, chapter 7, verses 14 to 17. He, Jesus, is prefaced and portrayed as the burden bearer. Let me tell you, I think of Peter's writings, 1 Peter 5, 7. Talking of Jesus, Peter said, casting all your care upon him. I wish I could preach. No one knows your heart like you and God does. But if you could just hear me, I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what's causing you to stumble a little under a heavy vexation or burden. But let me tell you as the song says, turn it over to Jesus and you'll smile. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not preaching that mental distress is not real. I'm not going to go down that dead-end street that pressures are not real. They are. But let me tell you, he is our burden bearer, casting all your care upon him. And you remember what the last part of that verse says? For he careth, for he careth for you. Get that rubbish out of your mind that nobody loves you. Jesus loves you, and that's enough. (laughs) Then in Obadiah, he is, of course, the mighty to save, portrayed in chapter 1, verse 17. And Jesus is talked in Matthew 1, 21, when the scripture said, And she shall bring forth a son. And thou, shalt, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. He shall save his people. He shall save his people from their sins. It doesn't say in their sins. It says from their sins. I don't know what has fastened on to you, but Jesus is able to, to break the chains and deliver you from your sin. Amen. Amen. Then Jonah, of course, this one's easy. I think it depicts him as the great foreign missionary. Remember Jonah was told in chapter 1, verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amidiah, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And who came to this wicked world but Jesus? You remember reading in 1 John 2, 2, It says, for he is a propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is a big 50 cent word that simply means substitutionary sacrifice. And he is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I say the answer to our world is Jesus. I say the answer to our world is Jesus. Is not more money thrown at more programs. It's Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, as we go to Micah, 5 verse 2 of Micah is a very famous prophetic word. But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come unto me. That is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting, prophesying of the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, 500 years before it was done. So in Micah, he's the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Man, that blows my mind. But as I've said before, 
You pick up verses like John 8, 58, and Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Hmm. And you pick up verses like John 17 and 5, the glory that I had before the world was, or you pick up John 10, verse 30, I and my father are one. Hmm. Or even you pick up Revelation 13, verse 8, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Man, you start picking up on these things here. His goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, I'll freely admit, the devil's a shyster and a trickster, and he's got every kind of a trick there is to play on your mind and your heart. And he has had, right at 6,000 years of of uh, practice in trying to trip up humanity. And so you and I mentally are no match for him. Don't ever think you are. But let me tell you something. Jesus was here a long time before him. Let me tell you something. Jesus said in Luke 10 verse 18, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now folks, that's pre-Edenic, before Adam and Eve. Let me tell you, Jesus has got your answer. Jesus knows how to solve your problem. Jesus can get you out of that quandary. Jesus can get you out of that problem. Hallelujah. I believe that with all my heart. So he whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, we come to to the book of Nahum. Nahum is a beautiful book, and one of the favorite verses I love of Nahum, and this is not on the subject, but I want to throw it out there because I love it. You ought to memorize it. It's short, but it's powerful. It's Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. It simply states, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Someone say, the Lord is good. Someone say, the Lord is good. And... He is a shield of them that put their trust in him. And he knoweth them that put their trust in him. Now, Nahum 1 verse 15 portrays and prefigures Jesus as a messenger that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. Oh, how thankful we ought to be. None of us deserve this. None of us could earn this Holy Spirit. He could have easily knocked on my door or your door and says, I'm dispatching angels to carry you to where you rightfully belong. And that is in destruction, in the lake of fire. You've sinned, no use to pray. And the devil would say, amen, amen. And, but as I've tried to give you in, in um, Nahum 1, seven, the Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows them that trust in him. So you can just say, I'm going to trust in Jesus. So let me come back to that. Nahum 1.15 portrays him as a messenger that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. You remember Jesus who had a habit of going to the Sabbath, or to the synagogue rather, on the Sabbath. And that's a good habit. I commend you for coming to church And all my life, I've gone to Sunday school. It's just a habit. It's a good habit. Now listen to this. We go to Luke 4, 16. Now listen, pick up on these words real careful. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Man, 
that's good news. I say that's great news. That's the best Christmas present you'll ever have. Now, the Bible said, and he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Listen, he came to bring peace, to bring deliverance. He's a messenger of good tidings. And you haven't lived until you've received forgiveness of sins and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, any student, not necessarily just a scholar, of Scripture knows that this reading that Jesus read from the book of Isaiah is from Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. And any serious reader of Scripture also knows that Jesus left out part of the verse. And there is a powerful point in that. Reading, and I'm not going to read it all in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Jesus finished it up, remember, by saying to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. But the rest of that verse in Isaiah 61 reads, And the day of vengeance of our God. Now that's beautiful, beautiful news. In other words, this messenger that bringeth good tidings didn't come with gloom and doom and negativity and despondency and disaster. He came with good news. And I read it to you what the good news was. And he left out the day of vengeance of our God. But don't ever forget that day of vengeance is coming. God's not mocked. You can't sin and get by. And the good news is you don't have to stay the way you are. You can be redeemed. You can be delivered. Hallelujah. You see... Without delving into all this, other than just one verse, Acts 17, 31. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Yes, judgment is coming. No one's going to get by. No matter who, when, where, or why. But you don't have to go to judgment. You can go to Jesus and let judgment begin at the house of God. That's what 1 Peter 4.17 talks about. Now, folks, this is sterling news. This is wonderful news that you can settle the old account up right here, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ by repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and receiving the Holy Ghost. This messenger has brought good news. Let's give him a hand clap of thanks. Let's give him a hand clap of thanks. Now, I'm only saying this because I feel prompted to say it. It's one other verse. It's 1 Timothy 5, 20. 4 and 25. I'm just going to use the first part when it says some men's sins are open beforehand going before to judgment. And that preaches to me I can send my sins ahead to judgment. Now how are you going to do that? It takes redeeming blood. And the only redeeming blood that's able to do that is the blood of Jesus Christ. As scripture has so faithfully said Hebrews 9 and 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. His own blood. His own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. (laughs) Let the ages roll on. I've got eternality, everlasting life, everlasting redemption. Give him another hand clap. Oh, how thankful we ought to be. Cheer yourself up. Tell that depression bye-bye. Tell that discouragement to get out of your face. 
You've been to Jesus. You've been to the water. You've been baptized. You got the Holy Ghost. Aren't you glad for that? Praise God. So Nahum, we appreciate your prophecy. Now, in the book of Habakkuk, he is portrayed, and I'm talking of Jesus as uh, the mighty God and the everlasting Father, is portrayed by Habakkuk 3 and verse 2 as God's evangelist, crying, Revive thy work, O Lord, in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. And so Jesus was that evangelist. All you need to do is read in Mark 1, verse 14 and 15, where, and after that John was put into prison, Jesus came from Galilee and preaching the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled, repent ye and believe the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. And so Jesus, his spirit, his word, and we need to pick this up, is crying, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath remember mercy. And all I'm saying is we need a revival. I need a revival. Would you admit that you need a revival? Come on now. All you need to do is look back to how you used to worship, how you used to pray, how you used to read your Bible. Oh, come on now. America needs a revival. We need a revival. Let it start in us, oh God. Let it start in me. Now moving on to Zephaniah. Jesus is portrayed here as the mighty Savior. In Zephaniah 3, verse 14 to 20. And all you need to do is is, is remember uh, the woman of Samaria's interaction with Jesus and the revival that Jesus had in Samaria with her and the people there that he preached and they begged him to stay. Then you read in John 4:42, uh, the people that heard this woman's testimony and he told me, come see a man, which told me all things that ever I did. And... They, they finished it up by saying in John 4, 42, this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Oh, let me tell you, all the religious societies, all the multifaceted religious places and programs and ideas, I'm telling you of Jesus, this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, in the next book, Haggai 1, verse 12 to 15, Jesus is foreshadowed as the restorer of God's lost heritage. Now, this brings up a wonderful subject, which I won't take the time to delve into, other than to say, God can restore your joy. He can restore your peace. He can renew your spirit. That's how he saves us, Titus 3, 5, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. You'd be surprised what a good old dose of praying back through and the Holy Ghost will do for you. <laughs> and so Jesus is depicted in Haggai 1, 12 to 15 as the restorer of God's lost heritage. Now, all you need to do is read the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, verse 24, who was restored by his father to his previous place, and God can still do it today. Listen, it's not over till it's over, and it's not over. Jesus is alive. Revival is alive. His word is alive. He can restore you, renew you, regenerate you. Hallelujah. Now, 
the next book, of course, is Zechariah. And in 13, verse 1, Jesus is prefigured here as the fountain opened up to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. As the song says, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. You remember in Revelation 1.5, it talked of Jesus. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us priests unto God and his Father. Oh, thank God for that fountain that was opened up. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, in Malachi 4.2, he's the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. Now, all you need to do is read uh, the book of Mark 6, verse 56. And I might suggest you read with it, Acts 5, verse 15, 16, because that reading talks about the healing that is in him, where people, if they could just touch the border of his garment, and everyone that did was healed. And that spirit prevailed. And the revival in Jerusalem was so great that they brought people out in the streets, and this is Acts 5.15, and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter might overshadow some of them. And that next verse, there came also a multitude out of the cities round about into Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to back up and say, well, uh, he might, he could, he perhaps will. I'm saying God can heal everyone. You may think what you have is worse than anybody else. But let me tell you, he can heal everyone. I'm not here as a razzmatazz cheerleader, but I am going to simply ask if anybody in this place has ever been touched by the healing power of Jesus Christ. Let me hear an amen. A lusty amen. Let me hear an amen. Is anybody here? Ever been delivered by the power of God from the clutches of the devil or some bad habit that had you bound? Let me hear you say amen. Amen. He's still on a throne. He's still alive. He still has the power. He can still do it. Hallelujah. (laughs) Praise the Lord, everybody. I said praise the Lord, everybody. So let me, at the risk of maybe uh, losing you mentally, but I can't always um, baby you. Now, I'm preaching to people that's been in church a while, most of you. But at that risk, I'm going to step it up just a little as we get in the New Testament. Why? In the book of Matthew, he is... The Savior, Matthew one twenty one, In the book of Mark, he's the wonder worker, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. In the book of Luke, he's the son of man, Luke 19.10. In the book of John, he's the son of God, John one thirty four. In the book of Acts, ah, 2.4 of Acts said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, 2 Timothy 1.14 said the Holy Ghost was dwelleth in us. Now, 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, God, the Holy Ghost. But Paul clarified it up with what you received when he said, Christ liveth in me. Galatians 2.20. He, he clarified it again in Colossians 1.27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, in Ephesians three seventeen, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Again, in Philippians 1, 19, the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Again, 
In Galatians 4 verse 6, the spirit of his son in our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Again, Jesus said himself, John 14, 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Verse 20, at that day, ye shall know that I'm in my Father and ye in me and I in you. So that's what the Holy Ghost is. It's Jesus Christ is in you. That's 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Hallelujah. Not three spirits, not three persons, not three gods. One God, one spirit, one, 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 one. And that spirit's name is Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. My Lord have mercy. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, as we hurry on, the book of uh, Romans, he's our justifier. 3 verse 26, 5 verse 1, with Acts 13, 39. In 1 and 2 Corinthians, he's our sanctifier. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. And 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 11. Now, Galatians, he's the redeemer from the curse of the law, 3 verse 13. Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches, Ephesians 3 verse 8. And Philippians, he's my God who shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory, Philippians 4 19. And Colossians, why, he's the fullness. And when it says fullness, it means everything you can put in to describe the Godhead, that the fullness of the Godhead is in him bodily. I'm not going to argue with it. Whatever you want to agree with me, that the Godhead, it's all in him, not them. Don't make a them out of a him. You better make a him out of a them. Hallelujah. Because it's all, it's all, it's all in him. Colossians 2, 9. Amen. Now, First and Second Thessalonians. Now, I got to check there. I, I always try to feel what I'm preaching, and I just got to check there. So I'm going to just put it out there. I wasn't going to, but I am real quick. First and Second Thessalonians. He's our soon coming King. Soon coming King. Before the second hand goes around one more time, he could split the heavens. First, current, first. Uh, Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do you believe that? Then them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not. Prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. My folks, cheer up. Cheer up. He's coming. Cheer up. He's coming. Oh, hallelujah. I just had to say that. Now, going to First and Second Timothy... He's the one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. First Timothy 2 verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. In Titus, he's a faithful pastor, and you're reading Titus 1 verse 5 through 9. And then in Philemon, he's a faithful brother. That's depicted in verse 16. In Hebrews, 
10.29, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant with Hebrews 9 verse 12. Now, in the book of James 5 and verse 14, he's the great physician. For the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, he shall be forgiven him. Amen. Now, in First, Second Peter, he's referred to as the chief shepherd who soon shall appear with a, with a crown of unfading glory. That's First Peter 5, verse 4. First, second, third John. Why, John depicts him as love. First John 4, verse 9 through 11. First John 4, verses 16 through 19. Now, in the book of Jude, he's the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. That's Jude verses 14, 15, the one and only chapter. Now think with me a minute. He can't come with his saints until he comes for his saints. So we best be getting ready. You best put things in order and perspective. Amen? But you know as well as I that in Revelation, the last of 66 books of the King James Bible, why, in 19, verse 16, he hath on his vestor and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, hallelujah. Would you give him a rousing hand clap? Would you give him a praise? Would you stand and give him that praise right now? Hallelujah. I'm not just giving you a lecture. I've preached to you unmitigated truth. Unalterable truth. Jesus is the incomparable Christ who is everything you'll ever need. Hallelujah. Now I want you to raise up your voice a little bit. And repeat these words, which in his times shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh, Lord, have mercy. That's 1 Timothy 6.15. Would you give him another hand clap of praise? Would you give him a praise offering right now? (laughs) Hallelujah! Now, if this King of Kings and Lord of Lords were to walk in here right now, what would you do? A great man said if Shakespeare was to walk into a convention of the great and mighty and talented group that was there from all walks of life, they'd all stand and honor him. But if Jesus Christ was to walk in, they'd all fall on their faces and worship him. What would you do? Now, I'm at a very sensitive point. Frankly, I've just only completed half of what I wanted to preach. But I took a little more time than what I thought I would. And I'm very uh, dedicated to what I preach. This has all been a result of many years, not just moments, years. Walking and writing and praying and reading and then reading some more and then reading some more. And I'm at the very tip and tipping point of the list of 1,311 titles. There's approximately 150 to 200 of them left. And this is what I was going to try to finish up. And it came to me. I don't say I'm hearing a voice of God, but it came to me like a lot of messages I try to preach come to me that I want you to have the people stand 
in absolute reverence, respect, honor, and worship of my name when you complete these. It came to me that way. And I said in my spirit, Lord, I can't make them stand. There's a bunch of them here. And if you said go left, they'd go right in spite of it. Because we all have a spirit that just don't like to be told. But folks, if I could just beg of you, when it comes to Jesus, you shouldn't have to be told. It should be an automatic response that you're in the presence of the supreme being of all creation. That There's none like him. Never was and never will be. And we are standing in his presence. Now I want to ask you, and I've made my decision in my spirit. I've been able, with the help of God, to do several things at once. And I know where I was going to go. But in my spirit, I'm going to turn it over to you with just the humble suggestion, and I'll finish this later, the help of God, that what would you do if Jesus was to walk in here right now? And having said that, I want you to do that, whatever it is you would do. I want you to do it right now.